Before we start, we're just going to go through a few settings to check the webinar can run smoothly. First, have you configured your audio? If not, please click the purple arrow, then the purple cog, and look at the audio and video settings. You should be able to hear me now, but if at any point you cannot hear us, you can go to the right-hand side of your screen, click the purple arrow, and then it's the purple cog to sort out audio and video settings. We're going to be um, talking all the time through this webinar, so if at any point uh, it goes silent, please check your settings. So let's do a quick poll now. Can you hear me? Yes or no? Please choose your answer, yes or no. Great, it looks like most of you can hear me. Um, if you cannot hear me, we're going to put instructions on what to do next in the chat box. So please check the chat box and follow instructions. Thank you. Okay, so let's have a look at the participant boxes that you can use during this webinar. In the panel to your right, we have the chat box. This will be available throughout the webinar. Please use it to send your questions. We will make time for a Q&A session in the second part of the webinar. So please feel free to use the chat box to ask your own questions at any time during the presentation. In the bottom center of your screen, you can find the status panel. The green tick means that you're connected. If you have a question and want to make sure we see it, you can also raise your hand and we will come to you. However, we will only answer questions verbally during the session to make sure that we keep the time. And now we're going to start recording the session so you can watch it at a later date. Welcome everyone to our webinar on teaching and learning online for Cambridge Primary and Cambridge Lower Secondary a question and answer live panel and thanks for participating at this great time of great challenge and uncertainty. My name is Sara Ceroni and I'm the Schools Coordinator for Cambridge International Italy and I'm joined here by Josephine McNulty, Schools Relationship Manager, who will help me moderate the Q&A session today. We understand that teachers and students are facing enormous challenges um, as they confront the growing stresses of COVID-19 and look to finish the school year through remote schooling. We also understand, however, that this is an especially difficult time for our younger learners, as well as for you teachers who have transitioned from the classrooms to teaching online, to teaching children and teenagers online. With the help of our speakers today, whom I will shortly introduce, we at Cambridge International hope to answer your questions and give you some practical ideas on how to engage your students and make learning fruitful and enjoyable. Let me remind you um, of the resources that we, Cambridge International, have created and made available over the last period. We have a number of resources to help you deliver effective teaching outside of the classrooms, as well as to help your own professional development. You can access all these resources, tools to support remote teaching and learning, webinars and online training, resources for you and your learners, as well as ebooks and other um, online resources from our endorsed publishers on the teaching and learning when school is closed page on our official website. And um, we're going to post a link to this page on the uh, in the chat box. So please bookmark this page and keep checking for um, updates and resources over the next period. For Cambridge Primary and um, Cambridge Lower Secondary specifically, uh, remember you also have access to our secure online support sites where you can download teaching and support resources like curriculum frameworks, endorse resources, schemes of work, teachers' guides, and testing and analysis tools. Again, you'll find the links to these sites in the chat box. And I'd now like to introduce our speakers today. Abigail Barnett is Deputy Director for Curriculum Programs at Cambridge International. She is responsible specifically for primary and lower secondary programs. Alison Borthwick is a Cambridge primary trainer and education and mathematics consultant. She has helped to write and deliver several of our Cambridge International training programs and is actively involved in our trainer selection events. Brooke Wyatt is Assessment Manager at Cambridge International and has worked with the primary and lower secondary team on checkpoints and progression tests for the last four years. 
And finally, Daniela Cucurullo is an adjunct professor of English at the University of Naples and Viterbo here in Italy, and a secondary school teacher of English and teacher trainer. She is an expert on digital teaching and teaching English through multimedia. Let me now give you a quick overview of the webinar today. So to kick off the session in the first part, our speakers will answer the question you sent uh, at registrations over the last, last couple of days. And then in the second part, we'll move to our live Q&A session. Um, please, uh, you can uh, keep posting your questions in the chat box to your right, and uh, we will make time for them um, in the Q&A session in the second part of the webinar. All right, so let's get started. And um, let's have a look at the first question that uh, some of you sent. And the first question regards um, course books and other physical materials that we can adapt to online teaching. And I think perhaps, Alison, uh, you can get this one. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, this is a really interesting question and probably one that every teacher is asking. So I, I'm really not surprised that it's here. Um, I've thought a little bit about how we might be able to use the course books, textbooks, pupil books and other physical materials. And I think the first thing that you will have undoubtedly thought about is, you know, just consider the resources that your students have at home. So they might already have the textbooks or the pupil books at home. They might have a variety of physical materials. But when you're looking at those course books, really think about what is it that they have got at home. I think also remember that when you are teaching in the classroom, the activities that we would call face to face activities actually take a short amount of time than if you're teaching online. So really make sure that you allow yourself um, and your students more time if you are setting tasks from the books and they're working um, in their own homeschool environments. We're going to talk about group work a little bit later on, but one of the things that I would advise is when you're looking at the course books to have a think about selecting maybe some more independent tasks, tasks that your learners can be doing individually or perhaps with some support from people around them. It's also helpful to think about breaking up some of the tasks that are in the course books into smaller manageable chunks. Again, the, the point about that some of the activities that we would normally do in a classroom actually don't often take that much time. Expect longer, set longer periods of time for your students and your learners at home. So think about breaking into having a look at an activity and breaking it into smaller manageable chunks, maybe over two or three days as well. Misunderstandings are going to be one of the things that your learners might anticipate. Because when we're teaching in the classroom, we use eye contact, we use body language. We're very good as teachers at being able to explain and maybe re-explain, picking up if our learners are not quite understanding. We're not going to have that luxury necessarily teach online. So think about when you're setting those activities to perhaps think about layering lots of different uh, teaching points just so that you can really help with that clarification um, when you're trying to deliver some uh, exposition. If you want to use some of the, the activities or the learning objectives, you can screenshot um, and often embedding them into a PowerPoint uh, is a really useful and easy way. What I would say is don't feel that you have to slavishly follow the textbook and the course books. You're going to want to pick and choose some of the more uh, suitable activities that uh, your students and your, your learners can be doing at home. So you're going to be able to adapt and mix it up a little bit more. And I'll come back to that point uh, in a minute. If resources are, are required, think about what do your resources have on hand? It's very easy to assume that everybody has paper and pencils, but they might not. However, hopefully they're all going to have water to electricity. There's some great things that we can be doing there already with the science curriculum, lots of mathematical investigations, thinking about picking up tins or cans of food, thinking about what their mass is. And of course, we're going to think about online writing with our other questions. But just being mindful that some of your activities with the resources might just need to be adapted a little bit. 
think about variety of pedagogy. This is something that we would be thinking about anyway uh, if we're in the classroom. And online learning is exactly the same. So really think about whether tasks uh, you would like your students to do some writing, maybe watching something, just doing some observations, some noticing. It might be that the pedagogy advised in the course book is, is something uh, that you think actually that's going to be more difficult to do at home. So feel free to adapt it and use a, a better pedagogical technique. Um, I've already said don't try replicate the course book in its entirety. Now, obviously, your schools will be giving you advice on how much content to follow, but these are interesting and exciting times. So we do need to be a little bit more creative and imaginative. So you might not be going through the course book in the way that you would if you were in school. Remember, home is not school. So don't be afraid to mix it up a little bit, go backwards and forwards, pick and choose tasks that are really suitable. You might also want to think about if you are teaching online or offline and this is going to make a difference and again your schools will be taking some giving you some advice here online teaching using various learning platforms um, particularly for primary students my advice would be keep it short so if you're going to use uh, a zoom platform or microsoft teams or other platforms just keep the teaching to maybe five or ten minutes to begin with um, so you will find that your students maybe are distracted as well. If it's offline and therefore you have the advantage of teaching asynchronously, then you can think about a little bit more structure. And so it might be that you're using an activity or a task from the course books, but you break it into those manageable smaller chunks I talked about, but you maybe you set it over two or three days, whereas in the classroom you would have nailed that activity quite quickly. Uh, think also about giving uh, one or two discrete activities, but also this is a really good opportunity to set some longer tasks over a few days, maybe some projects and some investigations. And finally, think about how much to draw and teach on prior knowledge and new knowledge. And I think this is really because actually one of the things that we want to do is to keep our learners really excited. We want them to feel really successful in their learning. So drawing on prior knowledge, which will support memory, retention of knowledge, give them confidence and success is really powerful as opposed to teaching lots and lots of new content. Obviously you can do a little, but that would be my advice. So hopefully that helps you to think about how to adapt those course books and physical materials. Great, thank you so much, Alison. And if none of the other speakers have anything else to add, I would move on to the second question. Um, second question is specifically on online resources, apps, and tools that um, we might recommend um, for our class in our classrooms with younger learners. And perhaps uh, Daniela, you would like to get this one. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, I can answer this question. And hello, everyone. Well, the question is what online resources or tools uh, we might recommend for younger learners? Uh, well, I dare say that there are hundreds of uh, free online resources, uh, tools, and apps, both for English teachers and the students. Of course, you can find a useful selection that is already available on the Cambridge website, the secure online support that has just been mentioned. But this website is also continuously updated. You have just to identify what works for your context in terms of activities that you want to promote and uh, that is to say you want to do asynchronous or asynchronous activity if you want to adopt a methodology or a strategy or it depends also on the class dynamics uh, you want to activate if it is individual or peer or group work and um, what is very important the language skills that you want to enhance the content of the lesson and the type and uh, level of interaction you want to use in any case i can give you some hints uh, 
uh, to find the right technology, the right apps or uh, tools uh, on uh, online and uh, to make the most of these uh, free online resources. I say that, um, first of all, I would suggest to surf the net and search for inventories of tools and of uh, open educational resources um, for uh, distance learning and remote uh, teaching. And you have to pay careful attention to the reliability and quality of these websites. Uh, just to mention some that I uh, always um, use for my um, remote teaching, uh, the European Centre for Modern Languages of Graz, or also the UNESCO, that have a list of educational applications, platform also, and uh, lots of resources that can help uh, not only teachers and students, but also parents, and this is very important for young learners. And uh, they can facilitate a student learning and provide social care and interaction during this uh, time of, clo uh, of school closure. But um, uh, most, of the so most of the solutions uh, uh, suggested are uh, free and uh, many can cater to multiple languages and this is also important. Um, even if the solutions do not carry the UNESCO's explicit endorsement, they tend to have a wide reach, um, a strong user base and evidence of impact, so I strongly recommend them. They are categorized and they're based on distance learning needs and uh, most of them also offer um, other functionalities across multiple categories. Uh, then um, I also consider that it is very important as teachers that we take into consideration the, our students' psychological and emotional uh, well-being. Uh, so I would would select also tools and resources that enhance collaboration, interaction, cooperation, uh, and uh, creativity. Uh, so if you uh, look for uh, learning management systems and uh, communication tools for distance learning, you, you can find uh, lots of resources and then you have to, uh, to uh, adapt them to your own context. And I would also consider the, the potentiality of motivation and engagement uh, because it is very important that we always promote motivating activities. Uh, then we have not to forget the need to improve language skills, of course, and the cultural awareness as they can be in a multicultural classroom. So please look for language learning, uh, distance and uh, intercultural learning tools. Uh, we know that uh, children have the ability to gain fluency in English uh, far faster than uh, um, older learners, but uh, um, this can only happen if uh, we, they, we give them a regular contact contact with the language as part of their daily and weekly routine. And so find the, the technologies, the resources, the apps that can promote language learning. Um, I would also um, mention some strategies for keeping students engaged while remote learning uh, to help you through this uh, very challenging uh, moment. I would always start with an enjoyable input to catch their attention a sort, I mean, a sort of ice-breaking activity uh, to set the scenario. And uh, this can be singing a song or taking turns uh, to sing or rap uh, each uh, a verse of a song or watching a video clip uh, to have students play and have fun while also moving. Uh, this is just to follow the total physical approach that is very uh, useful for uh, younger learners. This is a way to start start lessons in a different way and you can find lots of uh, uh, songs for kids or uh, videos um, also on uh, YouTube for kids and uh, uh, other um, channels, English channels. And uh, last but not least, uh, there are lots of uh, activities based on uh, gamification or gaming apps that uh, you can uh, select. Also quizzes online that you can choose 
you can also modify and adapt to your own and your students needs so just to summarize and it really in a nutshell i would say that ensure students have safe ways to access the internet find the right technology according to your own context and let your students learn but have fun at the same time because it is very important wonderful thank you daniela thank you so much for this all right so um let's get to our third question um some of you shared their experience um in their classrooms having a lot of students uh, and students having a lot of classes and spending their free time in front of a screen what can they what can teachers get them to do that is not just computer based and i think perhaps abby you'd like to get this one hello everyone yes i'll, I'll start with this one um, it's great to see so many of you joining us today and I hope you're all staying safe um, and feeling well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Cambridge resources that we have. Um, so we now have 10 subjects in our primary and lower secondary curriculum and it might be that you haven't been uh, teaching all of those um, but of course you're free, um, you're very free to have a look at all the subjects that we offer and all the um, teaching and learning resources and activities that we provide for all of those. And um, I was having a look through our schemes of work. So we have schemes of work for each stage of the Cambridge primary and lower secondary curriculum um, on the support sites. So primary for stages one to six and um, stages seven to nine for lower secondary. Um, and those schemes of work give you um, a suggested structure and activities um, to cover all the learning objectives in the curriculum. And for me, just dipping into those and having a browse through those gave me some ideas of activities that I could adapt um, and that I could use at this point, at this time. Um, and uh, ensure that as you say that it's not just all screen based work so for example we have our art and design um, curriculum and in stage one um, of that we have some work on observational drawing um, looking at fruit and vegetables so um, especially with our primary curriculum um, a lot of the resources that are required are resources that could easily be found in the home, as Alison mentioned as well when she was talking about adapting um, course books and materials. So um, there might be an element that you want to use um, online for some kind of stimulus or research. So you might ask learners to go and look at a particular painting or picture online or to do an online tutorial about an art technique, but then they can actually be doing some practical work um, for those more practical and creative subjects in our curriculum. Even with the, um, the more academic, the less um, practical subjects like English, maths and science, there are activities in the schemes of work that you can um, adapt. Um, and that don't involve um, students being on screen all the time. So for example, in primary science, there are some investigations there, um, and this depends on your context. It depends on how much you know about um, learners and how they are set up at home. Um, but there are um, activities around, for example, um, when we're looking at light in stage two in science, some activities around shadows that it would be very easy to get the students to try out at home. Um, in lower secondary in stage seven, there's some work on observing plants. And again, knowing your context, that could be something that you could get students um, easily to do if they have a garden or if they have plants in their house. Um, uh, even in, in maths, um, when we've got work on, you know, if you select the topic that's going to help you um, to deliver um, the content as easily as possible at this time. So if you're looking at something like time, there's um, an activity in stage four, which involves looking at calendars and timetables. So 
there are resources listed in those schemes of work that you could easily imagine would be found around children's homes. And I think that's a good opportunity to get them to connect their learning to real life. So they're not in school where they're used to being to do their learning. They're at home, but actually we can bring that learning to life in the home um, by using the, the common objects that are around them. So um, do take a look at the schemes of work if you don't normally um, or commonly follow those. And it might be an opportunity, as I say, to dip into some subjects that you don't normally use. Um, there's a couple of subjects that you might find particularly useful at the moment. So um, we have global perspectives as part of our primary and lower secondary curriculum. And um, that's a skills based course. And one of the skills that we really try and develop there is reflection. And I think at this time, this is a time where we're all actually um, being given cause to reflect quite a bit more. So, so giving children the opportunity um, to reflect on their learning, to reflect on certain questions. I think if you look at the global perspective challenges, there's um, some really interesting questions that you could ask and adapt um, from those resources that we provide. Um, yeah. And also, I noticed that somebody has a couple of people have asked about e-safety. We do have our digital literacy curriculum as part of our um, primary and lower secondary program. And that has um, specific content about e-safety, about operating safely in the digital world. And so um, there's some really good, um, really focused teaching there about e-safety that you might want to draw on. So um, do dip into those schemes of work. You will need to think about and adapt some of the ideas there, but I think you'll find a really good selection of activities that aren't just computer based and do get children moving around at home, looking for items or working in different ways, not just um, on screen. Thank you. Thank you, Habi. That was wonderful. Lots of wonderful ideas and suggestions for our teachers. Um, all right, moving on to the fourth question, um, actually a question that someone in the chat box also asked, um, how can I inspire writing online? And I think, Abby, you might want to say something about this as well, and then perhaps Alison would like to add something. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think we're both going to um, have a go at this one. So this is a really interesting question. And I imagine that the teacher who's asked us this question um, normally teaches writing, you know, in the classroom with the whole class and you have lots of discussion and collaboration and you maybe scaffold the writing together and the teacher will be modeling the, the process, um, especially when learners are developing their writing skills and developing their understanding of different forms of writing and all of that um, it is hard to do at the moment so it, it um, requires us to think a little bit differently um, now you might have some children and you'll know your your children in your context really well you might have some children who actually are very confident writers and who might really enjoy writing at this time they might really um, get inspired by the idea of keeping a journal or by blogging um, at this time they might find that quite an absorbing um, focused way to spend their time but I appreciate very much that you might have some other learners who really struggle to to get going to write independently who aren't so confident and I think it will probably take some experimentation um, but I know that that as other speakers have said earlier keep things simple start small um, you might want to start off with setting some really easy, um, short personal writing tasks and responses, because it's important that children feel connected to you as their teacher at the moment. So you might want to ask them just to write something very short about something that's been different in the last few weeks that they've really enjoyed doing um, and to send that to you. And you can just give them a little bit of feedback, just acknowledge um, and thank them for the for what they've sent to you. It's not a time, I don't think, to be really kind of picky about technical details about learners um, writing. It, it's more about having some genuine um, communication, I think, at the moment. Um, 
depending on your setup, you might want to do things like to start a class story where learners, somebody might start off the story and other learners might add to that so that you build up different chapters. So that there can be ways to collaborate, even if you're not all in the same space, obviously. Um, and again, depending on the age of your learners and, and what they're used to, you might be able to set up some writing partners um, or um, uh, use peer feedback as well um, to share each other's writing and, and to give comments on that. Um, and I think it, it, in terms of inspiration for writing, it's a very interesting time to think about um, perspectives and the different perspectives we're having about things and the different ways that we might want to use to communicate. So at the moment, um, I have a, a six and three year old niece and nephew and um, we, we talk via FaceTime and um, but also I'm sending them a postcard um, once a week and I'm not sending it as if it's from me, their auntie, I'm sending it as if it's from our um, little puppy because they haven't met our, our puppy, they were supposed to come and visit us and because they haven't been able to do that, they're getting postcards from the puppy instead. And so, you know, it doesn't all have to be writing on screen as well, you might want to ask your children to write things um, on postcards that they take photos of and upload to you um, so that it's not just all on screen writing. Um, but I think that editing online actually is something that some um, writers and learners enjoy a lot more than when they're writing on paper. So that could be something that you explore um, and that can, that can help some learners who are reluctant to put pen to paper because of making a mistake. Well, editing on screen is great because you can just delete anything that, that you're not happy with. Um, you might be using um, stories still, you might be doing shared reading time and of course stories are, are great stimulus for any kind of writing that you might do. Um, and I don't know if um, any of you have seen this on social media, it's certainly been going around here, um, something about um, Shakespeare actually writing King Lear when he was in quarantine because of the plague. And um, I was wondering whether that was true or not uh, and doing a little bit of research into it. But it looks like, yes, there was so much time during the peak of his writing career when the playhouses were shut because of plague um, that he wrote some of his, his best works. And yes, yeah, somebody said Romeo and Juliet mentions the plague. Exactly. It's a plot device in that. So we are not the first generation to be going through something like this. And I think being able for learners to be able to um, hear that and know a bit more about that is maybe quite reassuring. Um, and of course, it's Shakespeare's birthday tomorrow. So there's lots happening, I think, online connected with that and lots um, of theatres and museums that are making their content available. So um, I know that there's um, I can see lots of great creative um, suggestions coming up in the chat. I know there's great things happening. Um, and as I say, I think it's a time to experiment. I think it's a time to um, not expect kind of lengthy pieces of individual writing that are sent to you, but we can find ways to ensure that we're connected, we're communicating. Um, and as I say, you might get some really interesting creative responses that surprise you from some from some of your learners so um and as daniela said as well we we hope to be able to create some engagement and to have some fun as well at this time although so much is so serious so um yeah do do, do have an experiment with some of those ideas alison i don't know if you want to add anything thank you thank you i'm exhausted Listening to all of your amazing uh, examples and uh, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to top the the puppy and the postcard one uh, but um, I think I think the thing that I would say is remember the purpose and the audience for writing because it's really important um, that even though we're not in the classroom with our learners we do if we're going to ask them to do some writing there's still got to be that purpose and audience I'm thinking that actually that purpose and audience is going to be a little bit different at the moment. So really try to think about what's going to motivate your learners. Who do they really want to write for? Um, again, I completely agree with Ali that, you know, we're probably going to be doing some shorter pieces of work. Um, although I saw that somebody put on the, uh, the chat box to do a story marathon. So I'm really excited about that one. I look forward to seeing all these story marathons. The one thing I would say as well is that don't forget that just because you're not that not there in the classroom, 
you still have all these amazing skills and frameworks that you would use um, within your teacher toolkit. So remember about if you're asking your students, your learners to do some writing, you can still give them examples, give them some keywords to use, think about writing frames. Um, Abby already mentioned in the previous question about global perspectives. Another of the six skills in global perspectives is research. So again, this is a really good opportunity to draw on the research to inspire the writing and just be creative. You know, this is a really good opportunity to, to get that imagination and those creativity uh, thinking hats on. So hopefully that helps too. Great, thank you so much, Abby and Alison, and great ideas coming from, from our teachers in the chat box. So thank you for that. Um, and then moving to our next questions, um, something that teachers are asking about group work, doing group work online. Um, perhaps uh, Daniela and Alison, uh, perhaps you, Alison, might want to say something about group work for um, sciences and, and maths. Um, since we had a couple of questions coming in about that and that perhaps can, Daniela can add um, if she has something to say on this one. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you again. Um, so, I mean, there's no easy way to say it. Group work is going to be a little bit harder. Um, so we are going to have to think a little bit differently, but there are also opportunities. So again, depending on if you're using some online learning platforms. Uh, so for example, I know that Zoom, uh, if you and your learners have Zoom, you can have the ability to put your students into breakout rooms. So that's an opportunity to, to, to stimulate some group work. But even if you don't have that facility, you can also try and perhaps pair students up, uh, put them into smaller groups, almost use that kind of that self-help, almost in terms of a, a self-assessment, peer assessment, uh, group work things. Um, so I think it, it is really important to try and keep your learners. Connected. Abby's already mentioned that I think one of the things that we do need to be sensitive towards is that not only are your learners missing you, the teachers, but they're going to be missing their peers as well. So anything you can do to keep them connected, you know, maybe even have some uh, sessions where you are just there to ask about their well-being, to ask what they've been doing, uh, to, to have a look at what they're wearing that they wouldn't normally wear in school. All of those other things just helps your students to think that, you know, they are connected and then you can think about that group work online. Um, on the back of that as well, which it, it's kind of tied in, I can see a lot of the, the chat is coming in about asking for math support as well. So I can tie these two things together. One of the, 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 the great websites that I always recommend, and it's in the uh, Cambridge Maths Primary and Lower Secondary Schemes of Work, Enrich website. Um, and I'm mentioning Enrich, uh, which uh, is a worldwide free website. Um, it has over 14,000 tasks. Uh, it goes from three-year-olds to 18-year-olds, so something for everybody. But what Enrich are doing is that uh, every, it's around about every six to eight weeks, they publish what they call live tasks. And with the live task, the solution is hidden and the students and the learners are encouraged to submit their own solutions, which can be typed in, they can take a photograph of their work um, and, and they can send it in. And if it's chosen by the Enrich team in Cambridge, then their solution is published forever on the website. And that's a really good way of connecting students and getting them to work in a group. And I can see that somebody's already put the link up for me. So that's brilliant. It's enrich.maths.org. But hopefully that helps. Thank you, Alison. Um, Daniela, would you like to add something on this one? I wonder if Daniela, Daniela, can you hear us? It looks like she's reconnecting. Yes, here I am again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Oh, okay, so thank you, Sarah, for asking me to give my contribution to this question because I do think that uh, encouraging student collaboration with group projects is very important. I think that the, so sometimes students can be each other's best teachers, uh, so it is very important and essential uh, to continue to give our students opportunities to collaborate, uh, even online, in small groups or teams. Uh, uh, of course, there are different solutions for this, and again, uh, there are hundreds of resources in terms of platform and tools, uh, not mentioning one in particular, but of course, Cambridge is uh, supporting schools, uh, teachers, students, and uh, parents uh, through the website can find lots of solutions. Or you can just search again on the internet uh, with some keywords, uh, in this case, uh, collaboration kits, uh, distance learning, uh, teamwork, uh, online group or work group and you find a huge amount of material what is difficult then is to analyze these materials these tools to select and adopt or adapt them to your own context my personal advice is to make sure that these tools mix productivity and creativity that is very important because you have to get students share and collaborate on projects uh, you, you should always give them feedback and take feedback on what you, you, you say, annotate, brainstorm, make media, or just hang out, as I said before, for social interaction. No matter the use of these tools, uh, once they are uh, quality tools, but collaboration certainly can lead to better knowledge because it, it can help building um, social and emotional skills in a teamwork. Also, games and quizzes help a lot in this direction. And uh, then I totally agree with Alison uh, because I, I think that um, cap also captivating the STEAM activities can be used to enhance collaboration. Um, STEAM activities is a STEAM is an acronym that stands for um, science, technology, engineering, art, and math all together. And it is an integrated approach to learning that really encourages students to think more broadly about real world problems. You can find hands on um, materials and ways to inspire our students, your students, and make them have fun because uh, the activities should always be uh, joyful for them. You can ask you question like a scientist, you can make, um, have them make some uh, experiments online, you can have them design like technologists uh, or build like engineers in the while playing with their toys. Uh, you can also uh, play math games uh, with their uh, schoolmates or they, you can create uh, like artists because I think that the visual Visual code is very important. Students use visuals everywhere in their daily life. And it is also important to bridge the gap between formal and informal learning because you have to, to enter the houses and do what they, uh, they uh, daily do. Um, also, considering that not only visual but also art um, um, workshops can be a, a therapy for, for them to enhance a work cognition. Um, so these are the answers. Art therapy and the same activities a warm cognition. Find a way to explain the task uh, pre-recording a video tutorial so uh, to have the whole class understand uh, what are the procedures to follow and have them draw uh, something or uh, do a collage or a poster or infographics, something that puts together information information and uh, graphics uh, and uh, what else uh, it's also important to create with them lab books uh, so you can also create a uh, digital lab books uh, uh, assembling different materials uh, and uh, different ways uh, different channels different codes of uh, learning and uh, communicating 
in, in a nutshell again, just um, have fun to summarize the, the key concept of a lesson learned uh, through something that can be done in a collaborative way. And another important thing that I also would suggest is reading books together. You can also have lots of audio books that are now online for free and can be an alternative to have students read, understand and share the ideas. I, I think that also research shows how and essential and important is narration, the narrative therapy in boosting children's social and emotional skills. This means improvement, improvement in self-awareness, in social awareness, in self-management, in empathy that is very important and responsible decision. So uh, digital storytelling, reading and telling stories uh, can be therapeutic at the same time, particularly in this uh, challenging moment of lockdown. There are lots of platforms that uh, give you the opportunity to find uh, these uh, um, digital blackboards uh, where you can collaborate uh, to, to write together, to speak together and uh, to share activities uh, together, uh, such as uh, EduTech or Common Sense Education, just to mention some of them. They have extraordinary list of collaborative tools. Uh, and last but not least, I would also say that to enhance and encourage collaboration, you should also sh start a twinning project. A twinning is a platform of the European community uh, that is for uh, um, teachers and students. And uh, they work in the same school or in different schools of the European uh, countries involved. And uh, it is a plus platform with toolkits uh, to communicate, to collaborate, to develop projects, to share and uh, feel to be part of uh, a learning community in, in Europe, of course, but it is very important. And, uh, and there is also another platform, this is a global one, it is PenPal project. It is the world's largest collaborative learning community and that connects uh, students uh, with same age students uh, from all around the world. I think that more than half uh, a million students from more than 150 countries have joined this platform and they practice writing, they create original projects, they make friends from all over the world. And this for me is a way to facilitate authentic and cross-cultural collaboration uh, in and beyond the classroom. Great, thank you so much, Daniela, and thank you, Alison, um, and thank you especially for picking up the math and science uh, question. Before we um, open up the floor to some of the questions that just came in in the chat box, um, we've got one final question on assessment. Uh, so I'm going to ask Brooke to get this one. The question is, can we assess students by progression tests, even if we are in distant learning? Brooke, this one for you. Right, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think it's really admirable that teachers are trying to carry on as you would usually. And, and part and parcel of that is, is, is trying to assess as well. So the example that you've posed is progression tests. I think um, you want to think really carefully about the purpose of the assessment that you want to be giving children at this time. Um, you want to be fair on yourselves. We're in very different times at the moment, but also fair on the children. Think about the situations they might be in at home. Are they able to access the equipment that they would need to fully complete any assessment that you want to give them? Are they able to access uh, even an hour of time where they don't have siblings running through the room or they might need quiet concentration to be able to, to complete uh, a formal assessment properly and fairly? Um, I think we wanna think about the purpose of that assessment. Is it? Is your intention to give quality feedback to the learner? Um, if that's the intention, I, there, there's a lot of ways you can give feedback to the learner. And that feedback at this time in, in particular is so valued. I can tell you from having my own two children at home, I've got one in primary school and the others in lower secondary. Um, every piece of work that their teacher looks at and comments on means the world to them at this moment. It's that connection back with school, 
that sense of normality, but then also the constructive um, nature of, of their feedback that they're getting is what's motivating them every day. Um, so that kind of feedback is so invaluable at this time, even if it's just for that personal connection to know that you're still available, you're still there, you're listening. Um, if the purpose of giving an assessment uh, such as the progression test is to make some sort of judgment, um, to verify the judgments you've made up until this point, uh, I'm, I'm not certain that we can decide that that is a fair assessment to make if they're in um, different situations. You could have a class of 30 children who are all um, at home with, with the different surroundings and different contexts. Um, what I would recommend is if you want to use the progression test and if you can possibly wait until they are back at school, that that would be the best use of that tool. They are an incredibly valuable tool, especially if you use them with the progress checker analysis, um, being able to track where their strengths are, their weaknesses are, um, and track the progress that way is, is really incredibly valuable, but would be potentially more meaningful if you can wait for them to act actually sit the assessment when they're back in school. Um, when there were some, some questions coming up in the online chat there on the side there, I saw there was a reference to the um, on-screen progression tests that we have. Um, we have pro on-screen progression tests for stages seven, eight, and nine, and that is for the subjects of English and science and maths. And they are up there, they access there onto our website. Um, they do have um, a, a token, whereas our paper-based progression tests are, are available through the website, the on-screen ones, you need to, to purchase a token for that. Um, if any if any change or, or information on the on-screen progression tests comes to light, we'll make sure to make an announcement through our website on that. Um, I think that it's important when we, when we think about how we're going to assess the children is being just very aware of the different circumstances they're in. Um, they all obviously were at a certain point in the year when, when when we were all sent to to learn at home and we want to support the children as much as possible but also make sure that everything you're doing is manageable manageable for your learners manageable for yourselves um, be fair on yourselves be fair on your learners and and just think about the most fair way to support them but also you've been doing assessments yourself throughout the whole year since you've started teaching your classes and and remember to trust your professional judgment throughout this you 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 know your learners better than anybody else and you know you probably already know where their their strengths and their weaknesses are and and quite often our assessments do just verify what we what we know about our learners um so I know there may be more questions to come regarding assessment, and I'm happy to answer those if more come up. Um, but I see we do only have uh, nine minutes left to do a QA. and a So um, I'm quite happy, unless anyone else has anything to add on that. Great. Um, thank you so much, Brooke. Um, I think I'm just going to hand over to Joe, um, who's been collecting questions um, during the session, and perhaps we might get a couple more and okay. ask uh, you speakers to answer them. Thank you, Joe. Wonderful. Yes, there's been lots of great questions. We might not be able to get through all of them just now for the time that's left. So what we could do is get the, uh, the questions that are go unanswered today. We'll try to put together a question and answer sheet drawing from the questions that have been asked and try to give some of the answers. And we'll put that together with the recording that we'll make available too with the slides. So um, lots of questions, some have already been answered, but one of the key questions that seemed to get repeated was about teaching science online, particularly for lower secondary, and if there are any apps, any suggested websites, particularly for teaching, uh, looking at experiments. Does anyone have any suggestions for that? Um, I, well, Alison, were you about to jump in there? I, I can, I can, but uh, please go for it if you have another answer. Um, I was, I'm, I'm a former science teacher and um, of course, I'd be teaching my own children at home at the moment, it's become a, a slight personal passion that I've decided I need to cover an entire curriculum in a matter of weeks. Um, I must obviously be a bit more fair on my own kids. But um, I, I have been impressed with the amount of things I've been able to gather around the house in order to 
to do a, a particular experiment with them and it may not be what I would have done in the classroom um, but I don't have that at my at my fingertips um, I do have a lot of things in the kitchen there are some great websites I didn't come prepared with any of them I uh, apologize but we can collect a, a group of, of websites to then release um, but some kitchen chemistry ideas are, are always amazing and I think um, the idea is, is always just about making it fun. It's I, I've not been in the classroom for four years and it's reminded me being and, and trying to um, inspire my own children with science. Um, it, it's reminded me just how fun the subject is and and it's all about the, the context and, and the engagement in it. And um, I think it's one of the subjects where you probably don't need the textbook as much. But what you do need is is just some ideas and then reinforcing the the the, the science skills, the practical skills, um, it, this is a great time for that. It's difficult to um, rely on parents at home to be able to support the children in that. So um, not not every uh, not every child has a science teacher as a parent, but um, I think that there is a lot that we have in the household that we can repurpose and we can make up a science experiment about. And in fact, that could be half the fun is planning the experiment and then looking around the house. Okay, what can we use? What can we do? And then just reinforcing those science skills around. The, the planning and the observing and um, you know how we might present our results and things like that 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 can all still happen at home okay yeah I mean great great examples I can just pick up on a couple of things there certainly the uh, Association for Science Education CSE, they have some really good uh, things on there and currently their membership has been collapsed so uh, it's free uh, Science Sparks is another good website as is the Primary Science Teacher Trust um, but exactly uh, that what Brooke was saying, this is a perfect time to be working scientifically and working mathematically. One final thing on science is I would encourage everybody to go to the Cambridge International website and uh, have a look in, at the blog because uh, there is a very recent blog on how to do science at home that's just been posted. And I think that would really help people as well. Okay, thank you for that. That was great suggestion.